great. We are not going to go from place to place studying tabernacle of glory and it becomes a denomination. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because each group of people in each country has to listen to the Holy Spirit and listen to how God's Spirit is going to bring a revival in that place. God has already given me the name for that church there. And uh, it's going to be on a different emphasis, on a different work of the Holy Spirit. And we have to be very sensitive uh, to know what He wants to do. Because it's not the work of God, of man, but it's the work of God. It's not by mind that you can do anything, but it's by His Spirit. This morning we want to look at grace again. It's a very important part. This are the, uh, this, it's this word, and we continue the next week, and that will finish it off. And so, this morning, open your hearts and your minds to the Word of God as we look at grace and study grace and what grace means. Remember, we say grace is not just a divine attribute and attitude. As most people think that grace, the grace of God, is God's mercy and favor to us. It includes that, but grace is a commodity. Grace is a substance of God that can be imparted. And this morning we are going to see some ways which we approach God's presence and, uh, and receive grace. What do we visualize? What do we see? How do we draw on grace upon our lives? Remember the four Greek words that we have touched on from Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 where we have talked about approaching a throne of grace. So as we approach the throne of grace, the first word that we use, what's the first word? Aha! You need a revision. Exousia. That means authority. So based on your authority as sons of God, you approach the throne of God. You come before God's throne. And then you come to the second Greek word. Dunamis. You draw on dunamis. The power of God. And the power of God comes into your life and then you have Kratos. Alright? Say it properly. Kratos. Say it like the Greeks do. Kratos. Right. And so when you draw into your life, it becomes Kratos. Kratos. The invincible power of God. Kratos. That is becoming a part of you. And then, when you come to be a part of you, it becomes your strength. And what's the Greek word? It's good. That's your strength. And so we want to see as we come before God and we are emphasized on waiting upon God to draw grace. Waiting upon God to draw grace and we have to learn to draw grace from God constantly. Everything we do, we need to draw grace from God. Before I minister, I draw grace from God for you all. Before you minister to somebody, you need to draw grace from God. Before you do a work of God, you need to draw grace from God. We have to learn to draw grace. We establish some grace. So we want to see in the God's Word on being established in grace, on this doctrine of grace, that we may learn to draw from God's presence constantly. Even Jesus has to continually come to the Father and draw from the Father in prayer. He come into the presence of the Father and draw from the Father. In the same manner, Jesus told us in John 15 verse 5 that He is the vine, we are the branches, without Him we can do nothing. Now what does a branch do? A branch should continually draw nourishment. So this branch here will constantly draw nourishment from the stem. It draws nourishment. The only problem is that we as a branch, sometimes we get detached from Jesus. We are no more in union with Him. When we walk in the flesh, we are not walking in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, then we have to learn to draw from our union with Jesus. Draw nourishment from Jesus. And it's very simple, the best fruit for Jesus, all you have to do is abide in the wine. Abide in the wine. And let's look at God's word in the book of Hebrews. This time we look at Hebrews chapter 13, where we left off the last week. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that a heart be established, be grounded, be rooted by grace, not with food which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. 
It's good that a heart be established by grace. Let's look at the subject very carefully. Paul is contrasting here, the author of Hebrews is contrasting between being established by works and being established by grace. Being established is a Greek word that means to make you be able to stand, to be deeply grounded, rooted, to be able to stand by grace. We have always thought that when we fall, we need grace, but it's the opposite way also. It's the opposite way around. It's you need grace in order not to fall. See, we have all always got it backwards. When we fall and when we do something wrong, we and uh, we sometimes hear testimonies, or oh, we it's, it's you know I, I did this and all these things and I failed this and that, and it's by God's grace that I really make it. Yes, it's by God's grace, but if you understand grace, by grace you won't fall. It's the opposite way. You don't fall down and then ask for grace and then you come up again. In fact, the Bible tells us that you are established by grace. You are rooted by grace. When you are rooted in grace, you won't fall. You should obtain grace so that you don't fall. Not fall, then obtain grace to try to come up. It's an upside down view of the teaching in God's word. Grace establishes us. The word establish is the same Greek word found in Colossians that we are established in Christ. When you are established, you won't fall. When you are rooted and grounded, it's not easy to topple you. That's what grace does. So have a new thinking on grace. Meditate on the new revelations that flow on grace. The grace that is not something or some substance or some power or some force or some mercy that you need when you fall. In the New Testament, every act, every breath, of yours needs grace to function the way God wants it to function. We need grace in order not to fall. We need to draw grace and be established in it. Yet not many people are being drawn from grace. I want you to know if you learn how to draw grace from God, you will never fall. Your Christian life will only be valley and mountains, valley and mountains, valley and mountains. If you learn to draw grace from God, you will be so established, so firmly rooted in God that you won't fall. That's why it's so important for us to look into grace. And this teaching is so important unto you. If you get a hold of it in your heart, you will never, never fall. Grace will establish you in God. Let's look at what the author of Hebrews talked about. He contrasts this with food. Not with food which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. What is he talking about? There is this group of people that thought that they could please God by their, the way they do things. That uh, the outward form is more important than the inward form. Very important. Is the inward form more important than the outward form? Because if your heart is right with God, your actions will be right. But if your heart is wrong in God, no matter what your actions are, it won't be right. It won't be right. It's important to be established from the inside. And grace establishes you in the inner man. Grace is the substance of God imparted into your inner man. There is a cross reference here that we can study closely, meditate on these scriptures uh, when he talks about how uh, grace and uh, works are contrasted. Colossians, and uh, let's turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. The book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 20 to 23. Therefore, if you die with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Paul is speaking to spirit filled believers, Colossians. Colossian Christians, born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And yet they have not learned to walk in the Spirit. He says they are subject to regulations. What are some of the, re the regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, 
but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Paul was writing to the Colossians and said, Hey, you fellows are falling again back into work. You have not learned how to draw grace from God and you're going back to works again. You're falling back on your own ability. You're falling back on your own wisdom. You're falling, falling on back on your attempts to God. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with God. Jesus did not just leave us with a book. We have a book, the Bible, the holy book. But Jesus did not just leave us a holy book. He, he left us his person and his presence in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit. If you take the Holy Spirit away from the Word of God, you take the Holy Spirit out of Christianity, all you have is a dead religion. Yes. Christianity will become a dead religion if you take the living Christ out. With all its form of worship, Him, free Him, and a song. All for 30 time, announcement time, one more hymn, dedication hymn, and then uh, 20 minutes message, and uh, closing hymn, God be with thee until we meet again. And then the next round, you see there is a certain form of worship we have established. There are forms everywhere. But sometimes, you will say, stand up when there's an asterisk, kneel down, recite the prayer, wah, 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 wah. We all have a form. If you take the Holy Spirit out, you will still have the form. You still have the ritual. In the early days in the Bible, they have a lot of uh, rituals coming into the church. Some people say, cannot touch this, cannot do that. Cannot do that, and they lost the meaning behind it. And Paul was emphasizing here that they are actually falling off from, from grace. They are falling off from grace. Remember, our understanding of grace is uh, there is a grace of salvation, but there is a grace for daily Christian living. We are talking about this aspect of grace, not salvation grace. Grace in daily living, drawing of grace. So they were falling into the works again. You can take the Holy Spirit out from the midst of this church. And if you have a good mind and a good voice, you can still be singing a song. You will still be able to carry on, go to the motion, but that something will be there. It's called a religion. And that is why Jesus Christ did not leave behind a set of teachings. Have you recognized that every other religion leaves behind a set of teachings? I was being asked some time back about some teachings uh, from one religion. And they say, what do I think? I say, well, uh, that principle sounds very nice. Nice. Yeah, these are all nice teachings. Something, oh, do good to your neighbor. Yes, very nice. Nice. Uh, don't steal. Oh, very nice. Very nice. See, all these are teachings. Their principles, they are nice. They are good. But Jesus Christ didn't just come to leave us with that. Jesus Christ said, I will give you myself in the person of the Holy Spirit. When I go away, I'll send another one, the Comforter, the Paracletos, the Advocate, who will be with you, Paracletos, one call alongside you. Para means with you. Cletos, call, call alongside to be with you. I will send an invisible presence. He said, the world does not know the Holy Spirit, nor does he see him, but he is with you. You remove the Holy Spirit from the church. You have no more Christianity, you have churchianity. Just the church form. We need the Holy Spirit indwelling and present. And so the Colossians forgot about the presence. They forgot about the person. They forgot. In, in all of Christianity, there are two parts. There's the presence, the first person of Christ, and there are forms of worship. Forms of worship. The forms of worship cannot survive without the person and the presence of Christ. 
when the Colossians were experiencing what they did, begin to concentrate on the forms than on the present. They were concentrating on what they should do or should not do rather than on the person of Christ Jesus. Drawing from Him what we want them directly. We don't have a dead Christ. If Jesus died and left behind the principles, we have only a religion of principles. We have a living Christ who is alive today. He says, I have the keys of hell and of death. And he says, Lo, I'm with you, even unto the end of the age. His rivers, we have a living Christ. So we have to be sensitive to the living Christ and not just to the form. Which was what the Colossians were experiencing. Turn to the book of Galatians, they experienced the same thing too. See, all these strong so-called churches experience this problem because they have not learned how to be established in grace. Galatians chapter 5 Galatians chapter 5 verse 4 you have become estranged from Christ. Now notice, analyze what Paul said. Meditate on what Paul said. Paul said, you have been estranged from Christ. Isn't it marvelous? The Galatian Christians, born again, the Christ in water, tongue talking, demon chasing. Galatian Christians, they saw the miracles of, of God and they were the ones whom Paul taught and brought into Christ. Now Paul says, you are estranged from Christ. The meaning of the word estranged means you are separated. You are separated from Christ. Were they still saved? Yes, I believe they were. Were they still born again? Yes, they were. But their relationship was in God, with God was not proper. See, you can be born again, you're still a child of God, but you're not walking with God, you're not in union with God. This is what Paul is saying, you're no more in union with Christ. Jesus Christ is here, you are there. You are explained. Something has separated you and Christ. Something has spoiled a relationship. Something has spoiled a union with Christ. You're still a son of God. You're still born again. You're still a believer. You're still going to heaven. Your ticket to heaven is still intact. You're still by the Holy Ghost. But you're estranged from Christ. Interesting statement Paul made. Look at the understanding they have of Christianity. So important to walk in union with Christ. So Paul says, You have become. That means they are in the position right now. Right now, while Paul was writing the letter, you have become. They were separated from union with Christ. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Abide in me, and I in you. And you shall bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Jesus said, abide in Him. Now let's look at the words of Jesus in John 15 verse 5. Jesus said, abide in Him. Now if Jesus said, abide in Him, that means we can choose not to abide. If the Bible gives us a command, we can choose not to obey the command. If abiding is automatic, why did Jesus talk about it? Jesus tells us to abide in Him. That's why it's not automatic. Abiding in Jesus is something you have to choose to do every day. Every day you have to choose to abide in Him. You can choose not to abide in Him. You can choose to fall into sin. You can choose to live the way of the world. You can choose to be worldly wise. You can choose all the things of the devil. You can choose not to abide in Jesus. That's what Jesus said, Abide in me. Because we have a choice, Jesus said, Abide in me. You have a choice to abide in Him. It's not something automatic. Union with Jesus it's something that you develop, you learn to be established in grace. Now look at the Galatians. They were no more abiding in Jesus. They were born again, they belonged to Jesus, but they were estranged. Study the Greek word, study the English meaning of the word estranged. It means separated. No more in union. They were in Jesus' definition, no more abiding in Him. 
wonderful thing, you know. I found a new way of living. I found a new life divine. I have the fruit of the spirit. But sometimes there's no fruit. I don't know fruit or it was too small to see. I have the fruit of the spirit. And if you have the fruit of the spirit, you should not go around hurting people. Sometimes you look carefully, those fruit look more like durian, a lot of spikes. I had a poor out of spirit. Thank God that somehow he didn't write in the Bible, the fruit of the spirit is durian. They love, joy, peace, long suffering. That's what the Bible says. I have the fruit of the spirit, I'm abiding, abiding in the vine. If you stop abiding in the vine, you stop having fruit. And one of the struggles in Christian life is that they say, Oh, it's so hard to, to, to work for Jesus, so hard to do the things of Jesus. No, Jesus never asked you to, to work the way you did. Jesus said, Abide in me. I in you. You will bear much fruit. Your responsibility is to be in union with Him. The fruit comes automatically. Psalm chapter 1 tells us that if you meditate on God's fruit day and night, you will be like a tree that bears fruit in its season. There is a season for you to bear fruit. So when the season has not come, don't be impatient. Keep abiding in Him. The world, the world cannot stand someone who constantly abides with Jesus. Something got to happen. The fruit will come out and the world will see the fruit of Jesus in your life. Something has to happen when you keep abiding in Jesus that long. The so point of the Galatians, let's meditate on that. You are estranged from Christ. Your union with Jesus Christ has been affected. Those are amazing words for Paul to use. You who attempt to be justified by law, and here is this word, you have fallen from grace. Now, here is a word that we have to study very carefully. Paul says, you are fallen from grace. Now here is where all the teaching in Christianity, we have to study the way the Bible writes it. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, grace will help you to stand. The only time when you fall in your Christian life is you have to fall from grace first, then you will fall. That is why in order for you to go up again, what do you need? Grace. Grace is the power that establishes you. It's not the power that, that, that when everything has gone wrong, you have fallen here and there, you say, Oh, grace will bring me back. You must see grace as a powerful force, not just in your, in your times when you fall away, but grace is a powerful force that you need to maintain and draw into your system every day. Before you fall into sin, before you fall into discouragement, before you fall into depression, before you fall into the valleys of the Christian life, you have to fall from grace first. Somehow, the supply of grace to your life has to be shut off first, cut off. You have to be estranged from Christ first. And then, while you are estranged from Christ, one day you are struggling. It gets harder and harder along the way. It gets more discouraging. The pressure is too strong. And you will fall somewhere along the line. Understand God's word that grace is a power that, that maintains you, that helps you to be able to stand. In order for you to stand, constantly you need to draw grace. Without grace, you cannot stand. Also, the Galatians, you have fallen from grace. So Paul is telling them, teaching them the truth. You must come constantly to God and draw grace. Come to the throne of grace in Hebrews 4.16 and draw grace into your life. Grace into your life. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians 
chapter 10 Paul tells us and uh, this time we will consider verse 31 talking about foods again Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they, Paul says, may be saved. That they may be saved. And uh, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with a temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now there is a word that Paul talks about when you are attacked, when you are tempted. Now we are talking about first grace that establishes you in temptation, grace that establishes you even in demonic attacks. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Get a couple of scriptures out. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord. Be strengthened inwardly. And there is the same Greek word as 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, where Paul told Timothy, be strong in the grace of God. There are only two times the Greek word is used. And one is in Ephesians 6 verse 10, the other is in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, where Paul told Timothy, My son, be strong in the grace of God. Be strengthened in, in, inwardly. The Greek word strong is the Greek word endunamo, which is a Greek word that says be strengthened from inside. That has reference to the grace of God. Before you face the devil, before you face attacks, before you come against the devil, you have to draw grace from God. Grace in your life that will be able to establish you. Turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Chapter 4, that's right. Verse 7. Let's read from verse 6. But he gives more grace. Then look at the word grace again. Therefore he says, God receives the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God. Receive the devil, he will flee from you. Before you are tempted, before the devil comes to you, before you face a spiritual battle, you must draw grace, you must submit to God. Some people want to receive the devil before they submit to God. It's not possible. You have to draw grace from God. You have to submit to God. And what the submitting to God means the previous verse before in verse 6. It says, Humble yourself in the sight of God. Draw grace from God. God gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself to God. Draw grace before you face the onslaught of the enemy. We are emphasizing on grace as a constant Christian living. Don't wait until the time of your temptation. Don't wait until the time when you are being attacked and then you start drawing grace. Before anything happens, when your Christian life is flowing like a river as the song goes, peace is like a river flowing out from you. While everything is fine and nice, you must be constantly drawing on grace. Drawing on grace. The only way you can be strong and fight a spiritual battle in Ephesians chapter 6 is in the grace of God. In the grace of God. Without a shadow of doubt, this grace is so important. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 10. 
Paul makes the statement but by the grace of God I am what I am say after me by the grace of God I am what I am by the grace of God I am what I am and here Paul says and his grace toward me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all yet not I but the grace of God which was with me he talks of the grace of God as if the grace of God is a tangible power look at what Paul says I am what I am by the grace of God then he says by the grace of God by the grace of God his grace toward me was not in vain because I labored I labored he also had a part to play, play. when he talk about grace it doesn't mean so. grace, 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 grace Oh, it's all by grace, it's all by grace and you become a lazy slob. Grace doesn't excuse you from labor. Grace doesn't excuse you from work. Grace doesn't excuse you from work. But there's a decent way you carry out your work. Grace is not for lazy people. Some people, they are very lazy. And all they say is, oh grace, grace, grace. Morning they get up, say, good morning God, grace, 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 grace upon me. And they go off. And everything is oh, it's by grace, by grace. Paul says, the grace of God makes me work hard. Makes me labor. And yet, it is not I, but the grace of God that did the work. It's an interesting paradox. It's an interesting statement that he made. Look carefully at the statement that he made. He says, the grace of God to me was not in vain. Do you know that the grace of God in your life can be in vain? If you do not know how to draw on the grace of God to be effective in your life. Question. What did Paul spend his time working hard at? i like to know. He said he worked very hard. He labored. What was the part he labored in? i give you a little insight. His labor was in going great. And then when he goes out to work a work, it's the grace of God that works. It's the easiest thing in the world. If you do not understand grace, you cannot minister. Because all ministry and all your gifts that you're going to function in, your calling, your ministry is going to be by His grace. Now keep one finger, if you have many fingers, keep one finger on First Corinthians 15, verse 10, don't miss that verse, we're coming back to it again. And put another finger to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 6. And this is a word that will definitely open your hearts and mind to see that grace is not a divine attribute, it is a divine commodity. It's a substance that makes you. Romans, chapter 12. Verse 6, you have got it, say Amen. Some haven't got it. If you got it, say Amen. Right. Having then gifts. Uh, this is talking about ministry gifts. Your ministry, I call them body ministry gifts. Gifts. Deferring according to the, what's the word? Shout it out. Shout it again. According to the grace. It's the grace of God. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You will be able to say in your own life, by the grace of God given to me, I am what I am. Another person will be able to say, because the grace of God to them produced something else. The grace of God in Paul produced him apostle, evangelist and teacher. The grace of God to you may produce in your life a uh, teacher. The grace of God in your life may produce in your life an evangelist. 
and the different working of gifts in your life. See, the grace of God is tangible, it imparts into us and makes you what you are. And if God hasn't given you that grace, don't try to be. See the difference? You can only be what you are by the grace of God. It's the grace of God that is given to us that causes us to defer in the ministry, in the callings, in what God has placed us to be in the body of Christ. Now you understand that when we are born again, here is our Father God, so merciful, Jesus Christ His Son, the Holy Spirit. God takes off the riches of His grace and distributes it to the whole body. Everyone receives a measure of grace. When we receive the measure of grace, the measure of grace transforms and changes our lives to be what God wants us to be. Some of us, God puts His grace into us by His Holy Spirit and out comes a nose. Some of us, God throws His grace into our spirit and out comes feet. You say, I'm not happy with your feet. I'm sorry, you are what you are. But one thing is sure, if you are in fellowship with God, you will always be happy with what God made you to be. And so by the grace of God falling upon the body of Christ, being imparted all over, all over the world in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, some people become ears, some people become eyes, some people become mouth, some people become nose. That's why some people smell more than they hear more. All kinds of different gifts that God puts in the body of Christ. You are what you are by the grace of God imparted that causes you to be first. Now if grace is so important that affects our ministry and our very Christian life, isn't it essential that we learn to draw grace? If grace makes us what we are, isn't it important that we learn to draw grace from God? That we can fulfill to the fullness what God wants us to be. So it's so important to learn to draw grace. See, one thing to you on 1st Corinthians 15, you can draw our Romans. Now turn to Galatians chapter 2. Paul says in his own life in Galatians chapter 2, Verse 8 and 9 For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me through the Gentiles. Paul is talking about his calling as an apostle. He said Peter was called to the apostle to the Jews. I was called as an apostle to the Gentiles. Then the next verse 9 and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the, what's the Greek word? Grace. Perceived the grace that had been given to me. Now Paul was who he is because of the grace of God. Now you understand why nobody can boast. Nobody can boast. If God calls you to be proper, you cannot, cannot boast. All you can do is leave your hand and say, Lord, thank you, I love you. If God calls you to be a apostle, you cannot boast either because it's not you who make you what you are. It's not your ability, not your cleverness, not your smartness or wisdom. But it's His grace of God imparted. All you can do, as the song goes, all I can do is leave my hand and thank you. All that I can do is leave my hand and thank Him. You are a mighty evangelist. You also cannot boast. Because it's the grace of God that made you that way. And all you can do is lift up your hands and say, Thank you God, your grace made me that way. And it is important to recognize it's the grace of God that makes us what we are. The moment you become proud of what God made you to be, you are slowly being estranged from Christ. Then you become a prophet under your own power. Teach you under your own power, under your own steam, and you know your own steam can never go very long. See how important, even Paul in his life says, I thank God for the grace of God that has been given into me. And I am what I am, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10 again, because of the grace of God given to me. And then he turns around and says, I labor more abundantly. I labor more abundantly, but yet not I, 
the grace of God in my life. One fine day when we all get back to be with Jesus, we will be in His presence. When you stand before Him, all that you are was a gift to God. The only account you can give of your life is what you did to the gift of God in your life. What you did to the grace of God that was given to you. And to each one of us have been given grace. Ministry grace, I call it. Let's look carefully. What does for me? I labor more abundantly. What does for me when he talks about labor? If you understand the Greek word for labor and the way Paul uses it, it's not talking about working hard outside in the secular world. But he is speaking about his labor in prayer. If you have not known, prayer is a labor. That says the Bible. Galatians chapter 4 verse 19 If you still remember, the Galatians have fallen from grace. And having fallen from grace, Paul has a labor and his labor is as followed my little children, for whom I, what did he say? What's the word there? Labor. Say labor. labor. Say I labor. Paul says, just now in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, the same Greek word, I labor. Some of you thought, hey, Paul was a laborer. Yes, in the spiritual sense, laborer in prayer. You must understand when Paul talks about labor, he's not talking about uh, the labor in the world, working hard in the world laboring. You must understand the context that he talks about when he talks about labor. He says, I labor. Now, how did Paul labor? Paul says, I labor for each one of you. In verse 19, I labor in birth. Did Paul give birth? Yes, in prayer. Paul was saying his prayer was a labor. He labored in God. And when it was forming him, he knew that the Galatians would come back. Isn't it wonderful? There the Galatians were falling away. Here he is praying. What, it, what you would normally do is go to the Galatians and quickly push them back. But Paul never. He prayed first. And I'm surprised that many times people do everything without prayer first. When a brother or sister falls, the first thing for you is to pray. And after pray, you get the result in prayer, then you go to them. You don't go to them and then after try to pray. Before you receive something in the natural, you have to have it in the spirit first. You have to pray for it to be formed in you. By the time it's formed in you, you have excuse. From Exusia, Dunamis, Kratos, it's good. It's formed in you. It's a part of you. It's an impartation of God's grace and strength in you. It's formed in you. Then you just go out and receive. See how simple it is. So we thank God. We praise God. That there's a place and a time for laboring. But the time for laboring is not for us to come, right at a meeting, and struggle. We have to do our laboring, our homework, all at home. When you're ministering to a sick person, when you receive a call, if that was the first time you heard about the occasion, the first thing you do is to labor at home. Some people, when they receive a call, if you think that it's you doing the work, you will go. But if you recognize it's the Holy Spirit who do the work, you don't go first, you ask the Holy Spirit. Now, emergency, the first thing I do is to go first because I know I can never do anything. That's the difference. If you feel you can do everything, you remember it because just yes, Superman is coming. If you feel you are everything, but if you realize you are nothing in Christ, everything you need grace in part in your life, you have a call, the first thing you do, go into your prayer chamber, the king chamber. Talk to the king of kings, Jesus Christ. Labor in prayer. Say, Lord, I bring this case before you. What do you say about it? Holy Spirit, this me right you. Open me. And you draw on the God. You labor. And then when the Holy Spirit has spoken, 
when you go, it's not Superman, it's Spiritman. You can put an L on it, you want. Then when you go far, you, by the time you reach the hospital, you just say, in the name of Jesus, we heal you. Then you can just walk up, praise God, somebody say, hey, why is it so easy, you are not? I, I thought that you should rush there, and you go there, and you pray, and say, Who oh, rush up, no, 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 we give up, and wake up all the other patients in all the ICU. And how scared half of them to death. Then you have to resurrect the other half. See, if you don't do your laboring in your prayer closet, you have to do your laboring outside. When you reach a hospital, you should be confused. Holy Spirit, where are you? Where are you? Holy Spirit, at home says, I'm here still. You have gone ahead of me. I call you to come to the chamber, you go to ICU unit. You think the Superman. You're spiritual man. Draw from God. So important. See, we have got things all upside down. We we lay hands to do our praying. We should be praying and do our do our lay hands. I can say from the Bible when when in the Bible Paul uh, Peter needs to raise somebody from the dead. The book of Acts. So we have how to raise the dead. You better learn this right. I'm gonna raise the dead. How to raise the dead? Bible method of raising the dead. The book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 36. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Sabita. I think Sabita is something like Pankati. Which is translated, Doctor. This woman was full of good work. Charitable deeds which she did. Very nice, lovely Christian. It happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room, and since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Now here's the scene. They came to Peter, and they told Peter about it. This is another different town, and Paul, Peter had to walk all along the way to that town. So he went to the place. And in verse 39, as he walked in the hot sun, he reached the place he was all sweating. They brought him to the upper room. In the upper room, as Peter went in, the funeral service has already started. I don't know why they call him when they to lose the date when the funeral service was already on. In the funeral service, everybody was crying. All the widows stood by him weeping. So in the funeral service, it was very interesting. Everybody was having a sort of garment. Interesting funeral service. And when Peter went in, he saw a long line of widows. And each widow carrying a garment. And they were crying. And when they were crying, they explained that Dorcas had done everything this. Everything, every of these garments was stolen by Dorcas. Dorcas had a tremendous ministry. The first thing Peter did was to close the funeral service. This is in the Bible. See the next verse. Verse 40. Peter put them all out. All of you out. You cannot pray the prayer of faith with all these people, you know, with, with, the, with the clothing. I don't have any clothing to demonstrate. I oh, hear clothing. Ah, ah, ah. Doctor did this. Ah, ah. And there was not one of them. There were probably tens or hundreds of them. Ah, ah, ah. How can you pray a prayer with that, of faith with all these people around you? And all of them were weeping and crying, and it was probably very noisy. And you know how. Those videos can really cry. It sounded like Beethoven all mixed up. And so, Peter had them all put up. All of them. All of them he threw out. He got that from Jesus. 
to do many instead we will do that before to sue all of them up God will be close and God will lock them all out all these are believers and the first thing he did was not go to doctors who was dead at that time was clean nicely he didn't go to doctors and say he didn't go to doctors and say no doctors was dead remember and he just he got me wake up oh he didn't go to doctors and say he did it he never touched her at all look what he did he never touched her at all the first thing he did was pray never touched her never do anything all he did was pray it's very simple if you learn it the great way he said after he put them all out he knelt down in verse 40 and pray did he touch the body yet? no, no record did he speak the doctor yet? no, no record when was he praying? he was seeking the presence of God remember every miracle whether it be the healing of your common cause the healing of your headache or a raising on the day a healing of cancer any miracle needs a deposit of grace you need a deposit of grace in your spirit and so Peter sought the face of God he came to the throne of grace and he drew grace did he labor? yes he labor in prayer like Paul he labor he prayed scripture doesn't tell us how long but I assume it's quite long he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and then he was formed in the spirit to receive it he turned to doctors Okay, hello. Oh, doctor, speak up. Huh? Hey, somebody wash me. I'm very clean. No struggle. Where is the struggle? The struggle is not in working out. The struggle is working it in. Do you understand? The struggle is working it in, not working it out. When you have it inside, it's going to come out easily. But when you don't have it inside you, it is the struggle to pull it out. And you say, I don't know where and how I'm going to do it. The struggle, the labor is in drawing in grace. If today you receive the grace of God to minister and win 10,000 people, there will be no struggle for you to bring all of them in. See the difference? Because you have it inside you. If you put someone with the grace of God to minister to 1,000 people, in a place where it's 100 people, it will automatically increase to 1,000. Oh, no struggle. You put someone with the grace of God to minister to 100 people, in a place where there are 1,000 people, somehow or other, everyone keeps disappearing until they stabilize at 100. God cannot make what is outside of you any bigger than what God makes you inside. You have to have a big God inside before you can do big accomplishments outside. You cannot do anything bigger or wider than what you are inside. The secret chambers of your heart. Paul also did the same thing. In Acts 28, if you don't have to, i just give you the reference. Publius' father was sick. And so they, they heard that he was sick. You know this Paul? Pray, then he laid hands. Opposite. He did his pray first, after he did his pray, and he go for laying hands. Very simple. Paul says, I labor abundantly. I labor to draw grace. Labor is in a prayer. Now let's look at Galatians 4 verse 19 again. With all these things you understand Galatians chapter 4 verse 19. My little children for whom I labor. When Paul used the word labor, he talks about prayer labor. And then, it's in the book of uh, Colossians, another one of his co-workers. Sometimes Paul calls his co-workers co-laborers. 
you know who they are? They are prayer partners who came with him. They are prayer partners who came with him. Paul brought prayer intercessors with him. As he traveled, there are men and women who follow him. Men, they are recorded. And these are prayer partners. One of them in Colossians chapter 4, which we have is called Apophrates or Epaphroditus is full name. Who is one of you, a servant of Christ, greets you. Colossians 4, verse 12. Always, not once or twice. Not just someone who knows to pray once in a while. But he's a real intercessor. He always labors fervently. Fervently. Notice the word labor again. Labor means prayer. You do your laboring in the prayer closet. You remember the scriptures in James chapter 5? That the effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availed much. The problem is not in righteousness, righteousness is a gift. The problem is in you learning to come into the throne of grace fervently and draw grace. Grace is powerful if you draw it in. Now, as we enter the presence of God to draw grace, what do we visualize? What do we see? There's a key word here that you must not miss. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. The key is in those verses themselves. Talking about drawing grace again in verse 5 and verse 6. God receives the proud but gives grace to the humble. When you come before God's throne, you humble yourself to draw grace. God receives the proud. Proud are those who think that they themselves can do it. Humble are those who know they cannot do it. They need God to help them to do it. That is the second part, the ending of those times. I'm not reading the beginning. God receives the proud, gives grace. Now He gives grace. Grace is something that can be given. Something that can be given, right? It's not just a favor, but it's a tangible something given to the humble. Then what this is the key. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty, the word mighty, the powerful, powerful hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. You're going to humble yourself under His hand. Notice the verse there, verse 6. Under the mighty hand of God. In James chapter 4 when he talks about humbling, he also talks about the hands of God. God lifts up those who are humble. The hands of God. You receive grace from the hands of God. Literally what happens is this. God is on his throne. God is on His throne, you approach Him. You approach His throne and you draw grace from His throne. When you are at His throne drawing grace, you humble yourself before Him, you kneel down before Him, you seek His face. What God does is that God can reach His out and He literally lay hands on you. Some of you love to be laid hands on by teachers that come with a special ministry and anointing. Which is God laying hands on you. See the preachers and the ministers of God carry an anointing that God has put in your life is also great. When they lay, lay their hands on you, they transmit what God has put into them. But here the Bible is telling you, come and have God lay hands on you. Come and receive the laying on our hands from the Almighty God. That's powerful. The Almighty God of the universe. When you come before His presence, drawing grace, this is what you visualize. 
You see the children of God, and you see His hands laid on you. And His hands laid on you, you, you receive. Just as, it's as simple as, as a physical uh, laying hands by ministers. We have to use what we understand to understand the spirit realm. Because God is invisible. So let me use the, the natural or spiritually natural realm. When the minister comes, and you all stand here all ready to have hands laid on you. When the hands are laid on you, what do you do? All you do is receive. Right? You come to receive. You don't come here trying to receive or to disturb, but you're coming here yielded, yielded posture. You come before a minister, and the minister lay hands on you, and when the hands are laid on you, somehow in the end you just draw in the anointing. And when the anointing is drawn in, you say, ah, nice. And you get blessed, you get cut, and you leave blessed. We know how to do it with human beings, vessels of God. How much more we must learn to do it in God's chamber, before His very throne in our own private life. When you come before God's throne, when you're in prayer, when Paul was laboring in prayer, you know what Paul was doing? He was letting God lay hands on him. There's something that the Bible talks about God's hand that's very powerful, so powerful that you just need to turn to that scripture. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 4. While you're turning with your hands, say this with your mouth. Say, Father, I ask you to lay your mighty hand on me this morning. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 4. Look at what the Bible says about the hands of God. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand. And there his power was hidden. That's the hand of God. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 4. Out of his hand, lightning flashes. And in God's hand are hidden. The power of God. Now you remember when Jesus Christ told the Pharisees, the Pharisees said you cast out devils by the, by the prince of devils. Jesus turned around and said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you are unanswerable to God. By the hand of God. And in Acts chapter 4, when the disciples were praying for an impartation, Acts chapter 4, they were praying for boldness. He analyzed the prayer in Acts 4. They were praying for boldness. When they pray for boldness, notice they talk about God's hand. They say, pray for your hand. Some of you look, is it? It is. You read your Bible. Acts 4. Right, turn with me. You remember all these scriptures? Acts 4. Bible says, as they were praying, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determine. Now why is he talking about his hand beside his purpose? Because the hands of God in his hands, there are lightning flashing from God's hands. And in his hands are hidden the power. His power is in his hand. In verse 30, 29 and 30, Now Lord, look on your threat. Grind to your servants. They are asking for something. All bonus that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. 
Then he saw the hands of God are important. And I believe in the praying, God put his hands on them, and the next few verses say they were filled with boldness. God's hands stretch forth from the heavens. Place it upon them. The whole place when God's power come upon the room. And when they had God lay hands on them, they were filled with boldness. The next moment they did themselves walk out and in the name of Jesus, the power of God was released wherever they went. The laying on our hands from God. That's how you draw in the grace of God in your life. Humble yourself, the Bible says, under the mighty hand of God. Turn the first Peter again, chapter 5, first Peter chapter 5. In verse 6, therefore, humble yourself. And if you have to choose to come to his throne, to his presence. Do you notice that this sounds similar to James 4? Because James 4 says, Submit yourself to God, receive the devil. Then in verse 8, he says, Be sober, be, be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Seeking whom you may devour, in verse 9, we seek him. See, your power to walk this earth, your authority in walking on this earth, is dependent on your fellowship with God. No fellowship with God, no power demonstrated. Your power is only potential. It's important to draw into God's presence and have God's hands laid upon us. The hands of God laid upon us. And I can assure you, as God's hands put, are put on you, somehow by a wonderful way, His power flows into your feet. Almighty, powerful hands. We have come to let human beings lay hands on us who are vessels of God. Come and let God lay hands on you. In the Old Testament, it says that we continue to say, The hand of God was upon me. The hand of God was upon me. The hand of God was upon me. And marvelous prophecies come out. Marvelous, powerful prophecies that come out that today are written and see are coming to pass. What was the power behind it? The hands of God. You know what I love to do? I love to have the hands of God on me all the time. God's hands upon me all the time. And so we express it. Humble yourself before me. Draw upon this grace. They will be able to establish you. Run to your feet. Father, we praise you and we thank you. You are going to impart grace unto us. Grace for all of us. Tangible grace as you lay your hand upon this congregation. We thank you, Father God, for every need and gain of it. We are going to the hand of God touching every life here as we humble ourselves before you. Come to the throne of grace boldly. Come to the feet of Jesus and see that the feet of Jesus and draw strength and grace. Now begin to visualize the throne of God. You have to go into heaven in your spirit. Go to the throne of God, which is called the throne of God. 
How is God going to impart His grace to you? Not by a box of gifts, but by His pain coming upon you as you enter into His holiness, as you enter into His strength. His presence is here. Holiness is here all over His place. Holy Spirit, all over the world. This is Holy Ground. We are standing on Holy Ground. And I know the Lord is here. I want each one of you to enter into this place. Visualize God. Wherever you are standing, angels of God are surrounding us. Wherever you are standing, go ahead. Just enter into the presence of God. Enter into the presence of God. Go ahead. Go ahead. 